turn up the volume and free your mind because this is the Humans 2.0 podcast hosted by Mark Metry. What you feed your mind every day will shape your future. Listening to this podcast will strengthen your mind, thoughts, and beliefs. Leave behind the everyday mundane trivialities of your average human version 1.0 and meta-learn your way into becoming a human version 2.0 with a new upgraded guest in each episode. Enjoy. You're listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. This is your host, Mark Metry, and I'm talking today to the legendary Robert Sutton. He's a Stanford University professor and author of six books, which have gone on to be New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling books. He's also the co-founder of the Stanford Technology Ventures Program and Stanford Design Institute. Robert and I talk about a variety of things, including his latest book, The Asshole Survival Guide, How to Deal with People Who Treat You Like Dirt. If you like this podcast, please go on iTunes and leave a review because it helps the show grow even more. Enjoy. Welcome to the Humans 2.0 podcast. This is your host, Mark Metry. Today, I'm joined by the legendary Robert Sutton. Robert, how are you doing today? It's, uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to meet you, Mark. It's been a delight chatting so far. It's an honor, man. Robert, how do you spend your time here on planet Earth? Oh, God, it's an efficiency expert would just go nuts. I waste so much time. Uh, so, I, so I would put it into, into the kind of three buckets. Uh, the, the first is like everybody else, I, I do my job. So that means that uh, I got to do some teaching in some organizational politics at Stanford. So that it's, it's, sorry, it's like a university got to do some politics. Uh, I, uh, the best part of my job, kind of like you and we were talking about before, talking to smart people i'm always trying to find you know it it can be a, 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 a like, like a podcast as a, since i got involved in the podcast business sort of like you it can be an informal conversation and so I, i'm always looking for smart people to talk to uh and uh, and then probably if you if you look at what i've done this is just the work part the last especially well in some ways since for 35 years but especially the last 15 years I've been hiding in the same study I'm in in Menlo Park, which is in, in my garage. It's just a little modest study. Uh, typing with two fingers. So I type with two fingers. My children can't believe that I can't write. I just type with two fingers. And, and I, I'm happiest when I'm by myself writing. So that's it's kind of uh, the work part. Uh, then for sort of family part with three kids, uh, there's a whole bunch involved with it. Even though they're all adults, it's just amazing how many different things happen. And then family stuff. So I got sort of that part. And then, you know, for uh, stuff like leisure, we'll go on vacation. I, I try, I'm pretty successful to go for a bike ride every day. So that's mm-hmm. kind of like my uh, exercise part. And, uh, and you know, and, I, and then my, my wife, my wife is an executive. Uh, she's CEO of the Girl Scouts of Northern California. She used to run a large law firm. And so, uh, so she works pretty long hours, but just keeps going. So it's kind of the usual uh, kind of, kind of three buckets. Robert, I love that answer so much, man. I think it <laughs> sounds like you're a real balanced individual and you're trying your best. I love it. Yeah, I spent a lot confused though. That's part of being a, like a, a writer. I, twenty five percent of my work time, I'm confused about what I should do. So that's that. That might be that might be the main way I spend my time. Anyway, go ahead. I mean, yeah, I mean that that sounds right on. Like you know, I'm sure you can relate to this. But with this podcast, I'm just like learning so much. I don't even know like what to what to think anymore. Oh, oh yeah, I can. Right? I, I, re, I resemble that remark. <laughs> So Robert, um, you know, before we get started or, or go any further, I want to know some, you know, catalyzing events that got you on this path in life to, you know, sitting here uh, with May 2nd. Yeah, it's May 3rd, May 3rd, 2018 May 3rd. <laughs> with me on a podcast right now. Oh, man. <laughs> so, uh, so I'll do. Th- how about this? I'll do three. All right. So, uh, so I was a really bad high school student. So I think I had 
I'm I'm both proud and ashamed of this. I think I have the lowest high school grade point average of any Stanford professor. Uh, <laughs> 1.9 after my junior year, which in almost all A's and F's, like no C's. In, in two, I graduated 2.1, and I kind of went to the the uh, in the California. We have something called the community college system. And there actually is a funnel to bring you to the UC system. And so I was the undergrads are kind of floating around. But I, I always made sure I got A's and I drop out, uh, work, do mm -hmm. a little work. And, and, and then I met my my now wife. We were both dropouts. She was working at 31 Flavors and I was repairing sailboats. And uh, so, but someone, she went to Berkeley. So I applied to Berkeley. But I, and I actually got in. And then I realized I had to get serious. So then uh, I started doing research there. I, I realized I did not want to be a therapist as a psychology major because I don't like, uh, like it, it takes a certain sort of patience to deal with mentally ill people, which I don't have. I did not realize how mentally ill most executives are until later in life. So I, I went into organizational psychology. So that was one defining moment. And then, and then, and then the, the second defining moment was I finished my PhD and I went in the job market and my then girlfriend, she uh, took a job in San Francisco and is a lawyer and said, I hope you can get a job for follow me. And uh, so, I, uh, so I had a bunch of interviews at Ivy League schools and I applied to every uh, school I could find in the Bay Area. I applied to every community college in the Bay Area, but, but none of them would interview me. Um, and, but I interviewed at the Harvard Business School at Wharton and places like that. And then really late in the game, I saw that the Stanford Engineering School, literally, I saw the job announcement on a bulletin board at the Harvard Business School. The Stanford Engineering School was hiring somebody like me. So I applied and got this job. So I'm, I've been in for 35 years, July 1st will be my 35th anniversary. I've been an organizational psychologist in an engineering school. And they've been so nice to me. And, and, and then I would pick my third defining moment to fat, go way fast forward is uh, until kind of the mid 90s, late 90s, um, all I did was write peer reviewed articles for academics. So these are articles that very few people read. Like if, if 200 people cite your article, like you're like, that's really a big article. Hmm. You know, th and I did my dissertation on organizational death, uh, how organizations die, the process, and I did a lot of stuff on emotion and leadership. But then I met this guy named David Kelly uh, of IDEO fame. And uh, we started doing an ethnography at his organization. And, mm -hmm. and, and that was really a, a turning point because I started both writing stuff that had more of an impact, hopefully, on managers and individuals. And then I started, it started affecting how I teach uh, and how I think about life, much more empathy, much more sort of a design sort of approach, a, a human experience sort of approach. So, so I would pick the three, it was, uh, 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 essentially, uh, uh, high, what is it? High school, accidentally getting into Berkeley, um, then uh, you know, seeing that job announcement, literally the Harvard Business School, and then meeting David Kelly. Hmm. So, empathy and design. I love that. Empathy, empathy and design with a little bit of evidence thrown in there. So I love that so much. So Robert, you know, uh, you're a legend. You've written so many books. Good Boss, Bad Boss, Scaling Up Excellence, The No Asshole Rule, The Asshole Survival Guide. I just want to touch on your most recent book because I think it's really interesting. The Asshole Survival Guide, how to deal with people like uh, people who treat you like dirt. Uh, so why, why did you write this book? Well, so one of the things, and, and I think this is true of all of us, that there's when you work on something, and this is for me, when, when I work on something, I always have this fantasy about what the impact is going to be. But the mm -hmm. way that people react to it, it often is not what you expect. So when I was writing the no asshole rule, I thought it, it had a chapter about how to deal with assholes. Um, but I thought that I was writing a book about how to build a civilized culture. And I actually still think that is what that book is about. But the reaction to it is that uh, literally for a decade, everywhere I went, uh, it was over email, so I talk about email, but everywhere I went, people would essentially tell me the story about the asshole they were dealing with uh, and either ask me for advice about how to deal with the asshole um, or tell me a story about something successful they did. So that so that's all anybody would talk to me about. So that, to me, it seemed like I should I should finally try to do the best answer I can 
to that question. And, and as the book starts out, I mean, it's literally, it's everything from a, a CEO, uh, who I better not use his name, but he describes the assholes on his board. He calls, calls them board holes to just, <laughs> you know, a lot of school teachers, a lot of nurses. So the evidence is that, that they're actually fairly, uh, fairly oppressed. Uh, Costco and Walmart workers. And for some reason, a lot of priests and rabbis. Uh, who I didn't realize how hard it was to be a priest or a rabbi because you get it from all directions. You get it from the parishioners, you get it from your peers, and you get it from the administration. Uh, so it's pretty hard to be a priest or a rabbi. So, so eventually I gave up and tried to write a book about it. So that, that's, I guess that's where that book came from. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, your first chapter, eight thousand emails. You know, I I would imagine, it, you know, after writing a book on it, how much, um, you know, inquiries you get from people because it's a super, or more or less, it's a it's a perceived common issue, oh. and you know, we've all been there, right? Like oh. whether you're in school and you've been bullied, whether right. you're at work and your coworkers, or whether you're in a kitchen at a restaurant and people are harassing you, it's everywhere. You know, I used to live by by this philosophy. I got pushed down a lot, but then I kind of came to this realization that uh, no matter where I go, this is always going to happen. So I have to be the one to change. Yeah. So so that's interesting because I think that's well. Now, now we're getting into asshole survival techniques, but <laughs> but 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 I think that's true. That that uh, that there's but there's kind of two ways to change. One is. Mm -hmm. And I, I call these uh, uh, Jedi mind tricks or avoidance techniques. So those are, that's kind of two chapters, but either you find a way, it's kind of like kryptonite to just avoid contact with the ugliness uh, or you change your view of it so it doesn't hurt so much. But, but, there's, but there's two other kinds of change. And, and this is the kind of thing I'm constantly talking about. And I just had a whole great email exchange just yesterday. The woman told me an amazing story, which is either you get out or you fight back. And sometimes you do both. And so it was amazing about this woman. And it's, 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 it's sometimes I get these pen pals and, and it's really kind of cool because we did kind of like three weeks of her going through the journey and it started out and she, she said she had a really abusive coworker and a really wimpy boss who wasn't protecting her. This was in the university, mm -hmm. by the way. And so the stuff she was using was to try to come in at different times when her abusive coworker wasn't there and to not let it get to her, to have emotional detachment, to say things like, it's not my fault, it's his mm -hmm. problem. But then she did two other things which were really cool, which was she kept going over her boss's head with a coworker to complain about this really horrible uh, coworker that mm -hmm. she had. And she was looking for another job. So, mm. and then it's like amazing. So it starts out the beginning. She's like, her life is horrible. This is like in a three or four week period. And then at the end, it, it, it does not usually come out this well for any of us. We know this. It's like, it was like, I couldn't believe it. Both the guy got fired and she got a better job. It was like, wow. So, so uh, happy endings don't all, always happen in life, but I, it was so cool. So to me, that, that that story sort of encapsulates uh, the best it can be for most of us. It's not that good. You get stuck. Uh, you got to get through day to day. But uh, but but that that story it, literally just sort of I got just kind of got the resolution yesterday. It was it was so cool. So th that's the kind of thing that makes me really happy. That's awesome, man. I'm really glad to to hear that. You know, one one story that I can share, and I'm not going to say that this is right or wrong, but uh -huh. uh, you know, I follow this girl named Amber on Instagram. And she posts very sex positive food related things. Quite a niche I've never really seen. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Sex is yeah. Me. So then, so then I messaged her. I was like, "Hey, like, you know, what are you about?" And she basically told me that she worked coworkers, her chefs were slapping her ass, you know, sexually oh. harassing her, things like that. And she told me, you know, for a while she was really down and she felt trapped. But then she said that she turned it around and she started to do the same thing with them. And she kind of like put on this <laughs> sex chef persona. And I mean, it seems like she's she's doing really well. So, you know, I, I think to a degree, like embracing it, you know, I'm definitely not going to tell everyone to do that because I don't think that's going right. to work for a lot of people. But I think to a degree, you know, kind of embracing it and maybe adding some humor is uh, is essential. Uh -huh. What do you think about that? 
Well, so it is sort of interesting. So, so I mean, you, the idea of fueling sexual harassment or assault is not a good thing. But, mm -hmm. but what it 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 sort of um, reminds me of is is uh, th there's this researcher. I think her name is Mandy O'Neill, and she did research on uh, actually situations with firefighters and the kind of female firefighters who fit in well versus have trouble. In, in, in the firehouse, because it's it's one of those occupations sort of where women are starting to enter more and more, and it's kind of a blue collar, heavy sort of sexual joking. And so so essentially what she found, and, and, and there's some sex sexism issues here because some women and, and some men aren't going to be very good at this, but the one who would get involved in the boisterous joking, those were the one, regardless of gender, who would fit in. And so to me, that's what that's what you're sort of reminding me of is this sort of boisterous uh, uh, joking. And, and some of it might be sexualized, but it's also uh, there's different you know, they call us emotion display rules or the norms about emotional expression and occupation. It, and, and at least whenever I worked in expression, when I was younger, I, I would work fixing sailboats and uh, I worked as a painter for a while and stuff like that. Um, and I worked in kitchens actually the main thing i did was the, the idea of uh, she called, used the word joviality that that there's this constant teasing and joking and happiness and you kind of have to have a thick skin and and that does create a bunch of problems especially when it comes to sexual assault or harassment or anybody who has any kind of weakness or just doesn't get the social part of it but uh, but it is interesting it's, it's her name's i think mandy o'neill it's this idea of joviality or the boisterous joking in certain blue collar occupations, that's, that's the women who fit in. And those are the guys who fit in. So, so that's what it reminds me of, but boy, that can be a dangerous strategy too, because if, uh, if the guys are doing the boisterous joking and the women are being hurt and feel harassed um, or, or the other way around. So I, I, I've, I've been in situations where I'm one of the only guys and, and uh, the, the women actually, are talking aggressively about sex. And I remember a situation they were, they were talking about how cute other guys were and everything. Like, and I couldn't say, I, there was nothing I could figure out how to say like, except to be quiet, which is, you know, given all the, the, the times that women have, men have done that to women, I deserve to shut up and, and, and say nothing. But, uh, but, but fitting into those situations reminds you of that boisterousness. That's, so that's a pretty cool story. <laughs> Yeah, that's, uh, that's that's super interesting. So, Robert, you know, you you mentioned that uh, like you know, Robert before I talked, um, you said that that lady she was also looking for another job, and she also was telling her boss. Is there kind of a a third route that somebody can take? You know, let's say, you know, you're in a workplace where mm -hmm. it is super hard, or you're in a school that's super hard. You know what? What else can maybe you do on on an individual level to help you know mitigate your risk of uh, you know the exposure to to assholes? Really? Oh, well. <laughs> so I there's lots of the, the first thing, and, and for most of us, this isn't possible, honestly. But the 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 best, the absolute best solution is before you enter a situation, if you can get some information about how people behave there and whether or not it's a nasty place. Um, that's the best of all solutions because, and, and, and for, for the workplace, and this happens for people who look for PhD advisors mm -hmm. too, or other sorts of advisors in life. If you can find people who used to work for that person and be, because the people who still work for them, expressing assholes might be so oppressed. They're, they're afraid to say anything. So if you can find somebody who could, I call them like the early warning systems. And, and I actually, I, in the no asshole rule, uh, I talk about this. Um, my wife got offered a job very early in her career. This is about 30 years ago for a famous Silicon Valley litigator uh, attorney. And she, ba she basically accepted the job because she's at another law firm. And then a guy who used to call, used to work there, called her and said he's an abusive asshole, and he's also oppressive. He'll make, he'll call you at uh, midnight and give you a three-hour job and want it by eight in the morning. That kind of because in Silicon Valley, <laughs> lawyers can be nuts. They can really be fucking uh, crazy. Um, and so, uh, so she she calls up HR at the law firm and she said, "So I've 
had some second thoughts and I've decided not to come there. And so the guy calls her up and screams at her and swears at her for 15 minutes for not taking the job. And my wife is a very calm person, uh, said, I'm sorry to upset you, but your behavior in this phone call has confirmed my decision not to work for you and the information I have about your behavior. So, so that's the best it can be. But for most of us, we don't get that sort of information. And then you're in, you're left with, well, if, can you quit? Can you get out? Uh, or if you can't get out, then you're into this notion of, well, you, and I call these asshole avoidance techniques or dodging. So people, you find ways to limit your contact with them. What uh, what wh One of my favorite ones, it, it, I actually say lots of nice things about Steve Jobs in the book, is not being a bad an asshole as some people think. But still, I met an Apple engineer who was at Apple for many, many years. And she said, and he said he learned when you go to a meeting with Steve Jobs, you do not sit next to him and you sit on the, you think about this, it's a, it's a square table. You sit on the same side of the table as far away from him as possible because he can't make eye contact with you very well. So I thought like that was really, really kind of a sophisticated coping technique that he would look where Steve sat <laughs> and try to figure out how to avoid. And he said, so what happened was that the more interaction with him, the more likely you would be there working till two in the morning for three days. That was sort of his his assessment because you know Steve would get obsessed with something. It, even the positive part, Steve would get obsessed and decide you needed to work for three days. But uh, but so there's that kind. And then to, some of the most effective ones, and, and in the new book, I really got into this. Uh, for those of us, including me, who've had therapy, there's this thing called cognitive behavioral therapy. And what co the, the idea mm -hmm. of cognitive behavioral therapy is to get you to come up with perceptions of situations that are not as upsetting as they would be, even though you don't change the situation. And, uh, and, and so that's things like uh, uh, saying to yourself, the Mo Michelle Obama thing, when they go low, we go high. So uh, like, I'm too good a person to get involved in that. And uh, not taking it, 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 it personally, seeing the humor in it. But th those things actually um, are quite effective um, to get through situations. But if you're going to work and you're being abused every day, uh, you got to be careful. Maybe it's time to go. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think there's, um, you know, a black and white answer just because it's so diverse and it's so oh. um, specific, right? But, you know, one thing that, you know, has really helped me, which you mentioned at the beginning was uh, empathy, right? Yep. So uh, I talked about this on a podcast yesterday with a different author, but you know, we talked about this thing. It's called a reality distortion field. I, I think, yeah. you know, Steve Jobs is rumored to have it and a lot of um, people that have done some considerate things in history. But basically the way that I think about that is, you know, let's say I'm driving and uh -huh. I'm at a stoplight and, you know, some guy cuts me off and he flips me off, right? The first thing that pops in my mind, you know, reality number one is, wow, that guy is such an asshole. I don't <laughs> deserve this. You know, classic things like that. Uh, reality number two, maybe this guy has had a really hard day. It's like 90 degrees out. Right. Everyone's pissed off. Maybe he just got a call from the doctor that says, you know, his wife is dying and he needs, he needs to get to the hospital as soon as possible. And, you know, for me, I'm never going to know the, the real answer to that ever. So I might as well pick number two because it's going to help my reality perception for me to make myself deal better with the world. So, so I, th I think that's actually brilliant. And does it, so you're accomplishing to me a bunch of things at once. One is you're saying, whether or not it's true, it doesn't matter. You're saying it's not me, it's it's him. So you're you're taking the, lo it's the load off them. The second thing you're saying is, well, uh, maybe they're just a temporary asshole. Uh, mm -hmm. They've just had a bad day, and, mm -hmm. and 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 that way you have some empathy for. It. So so in the end, since you can't control the situation, to me you're doing things to feel good about it. And and and, and this notion that in many situations when people are like like most of us aren't nasty all the time, and and maybe we're just having a bad day. So what are we? I, I had this student. God, this is a long time ago. <laughs> she what Pam Epstein. She's who she went to work for Disney. And, and 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 Disney is great at sort of like training people to deal with difficult people. And, and the training they gave her was almost exactly what you described. So you come onto a family, they're really being obnoxious, they're screaming, they're out of control. And instead of being mad at them, you think about, oh, 
gee, you know, maybe they had a really hard time getting here. Maybe they spent their whole, they saved all year to go to Disneyland. And, you know, their kid fell and hurt their knee. Right? And, and, and they have all, the, so it's the exact same thing that, that um, having some empathy for them helps. That said, there's some people who they sort of reach the point where they're just so obnoxious and so nasty and, and you're dealing with them repeatedly. Well, in, in the car, I guess you call the cops, but in, in, in Disneyland, I have this in the book, they actually have a place um, where they take people who are sort of out of control and separate them from everybody else. So, so first there's sympathy and empathy, and then there's, there's uh, isolation, and then there's expulsion, which I think that's a reasonable gradient. <laughs> that's hilarious, man. sounds like I need to go work at Disney. <laughs> Some Disney training grounds. Amazing place. <laughs> for sure. Amazing place. So Robert, so for the people that have not read this book and might not buy this book, what would be the one thing that you would want to communicate to them for them Ooh. to to benefit? I think it follows pretty well from the conversation we're having now, which which is that uh, it's really easy when 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 you feel put on by someone to immediately say they're an asshole and I'm good. Mm. And, and that's true sometimes, but but the first reactions I kind of liked you had with the car is to essentially be slow to label people, especially as sort of certified or enduring assholes, because a lot of us are having bad days. And then the other thing that happens is, is that uh, it actually, we might be the asshole in this situation. Mm -hmm. So we might have thin skin or we may have provoked the person. I mean, so we probably all know people like this, the kind of person where everywhere they go, uh, people treat them like dirt, the, 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 like the, like the person who insults every waiter. Like, so yeah. you're going to be treated like that. Like, like, or, or every, I was in the Apple store yesterday, and there was there was one guy who was walking around who was insulting every Apple employee, and he was not being treated very well, even though they were trying. I'm sure he sees assholes wherever they go. So my my big takeaway is uh, that yes, there are assholes in life, but essentially be slow to label other people as assholes and be fast to label yourself as an asshole. So that's, that's sort of the guiding mantra of the book. Wow. That's, um, that's super interesting. You know, I've heard one theory. I don't know if it's right or not, but your ego will see your own faults in other people <laughs> as a way to tell you. But like to you, you're, you're totally perfect. You're, you're a sand, right. which speaks to a lot about what you just said. Well, I mean, I, I don't think that most of us see, see ourselves as being totally perfect, but but I think that we most of us are sort of slow to see our faults, and and it's some and there's some people who label themselves as assholes too quickly too. So it, I, there's different range of neuroses, but that still is is what is what I would start with. That and then I guess it, the, the corollary is, it has to do with social contagion is that uh, is that um, essentially in life we are so strongly influenced by the people around us look at the people around you and you're going to join uh, because uh, the odds are you are going to start acting like them. They aren't going to start acting like you. That I mean, has to do with relationships with, with uh, people, the groups you join, the, the jobs you take. Uh, look at the other people in life because you will become like them. I love that so much. Robert, thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Where can people go to connect with you and, and check out your work? Uh, so the, the, the best place is, uh, my website, bobsutton.net. So that's probably the best, the best place that you maybe put that in the show notes. And then the other thing, and we were talking about this. Uh, so my new area of work is on organizational friction with my buddy, Huggy Rao. And we're really into this notion that all these people we've met are frustrated, exhausted by the jobs they have. So we're trying to figure out what what causes people to be frustrated and be in jobs and organizations where it's impossible to get anything done and to try to figure out how to, how to fix it. And so I've got a new, uh, I'm following your footsteps. I've got a, a, something called the friction podcast, which comes out of Stanford and uh, we're now in our second season. And so this coming season, uh, the first, the first uh, episode uh, appears May 30th. And our episode is this amazing Harvard professor named Nancy Kane and she writes about courageous people in history like Shackleton and, uh, and Abraham Lincoln and Rachel Carson, and how they overcame incredibly amounts of friction. 
and overcame it to have great successes. And you know, so we're having we're having a lot of fun like that. And we got everything from her to the the uh, a guy named uh, Michael Arena, who's head of uh, talent at General Motors, about how to get rid of friction in like a huge complex organization. So I know, so we're having a lot of fun with that. That's awesome. That sounds super awesome. I'm definitely going to listen to that. And all those links will be down below in the show notes, like you mentioned. Right. Robert, this show is called Humans 2.0. And without a doubt, man, you are a human version 2.0. I think you offer this unique perspective to kind of, you know, bridge the gap for assholes and to assholes. So thank you <laughs> so much for that. Final thing, Robert, I asked my guests to leave the audience with a self-inquisitive question because I think questions are really powerful. You know, something to kind of just ask themselves throughout the day. Do you have a question that you would like to ask uh, the Humans 2.0 audience? Ooh, that's really <laughs> interesting. So um, so the, the question that, and, and as I get older, I find myself asking this more and more. The, the question that I would um, have people ask themselves, um, when they're in groups with other people, um, so, so, so this is a sort of specific situation. There's all this research about what happens when you're in a group. One is, this is, this is around how the self I'm presenting to the group and, and whether I'm helping or hurting everybody around me. So, so there's three questions that I would ask, but they're all related. One is, and it's kind of funny since I'm talking like crazy. How I, I, how much am I talking versus everybody else? Because there's some mm -hmm. people who talk way too much, and some people who talk way too little. And then and then the other one, and I, this comes from my co-author Huggy Rao. Uh, among the things I'm saying, what percentage of them are statements? So that statements you show off your knowledge. Hey, I know so much. And I've been doing this in this podcast. And 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 then the 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 other questions is. The other part is what percentage are questions? And when you look at people who are, especially people who have more power, they're, they talk, the best leaders talk less than uh, they probably can get away with. They make fewer statements and they ask more questions. So, so that's, mm -hmm. that, and, and especially the older I get, the more that I, the more that I start trying to monitor myself and not just, uh, show off my knowledge, which actually sometimes makes you look stupid because when you make a statement about something that you don't know as much uh, about, then so somebody responds, well, actually, and they're right sometimes. So it's also a protective device. But th that, 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 that's the kind of questions when, you, when you're when you in, and this is you're going out to dinner, you're with friends, you're with families, people, you know, that's one reason this is so enjoyable. You're listening and you're asking questions. So, uh, so this is probably more fun for me than for you. But so that's the other thing is, is you'll be more well liked if you do that sort of thing too. Man, those are really powerful. I'm going to think about that. Well, I don't want to leave it on, you know, any stronger note. Thank you everyone for listening Thank to you. the Humans 2.0 podcast with the legendary Robert Sutton. And this has been your host, Mark Metry. Thanks, Mark. Thank you for listening to the Humans 2.0 podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of podcasts out there, and you chose to listen to this. Please subscribe, share, and tell a friend about Humans 2.0 so they can improve as well. If you loved listening to that, I would love your feedback whether you're watching this on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, and anything else. Keep learning on the Humans 2.0 podcast.